Do you enjoy the harvest of Missouri through food, fuel, or fiber? Interested in strengthening your community or making a difference in the lives of others? You're in the right place. This is Stand for Ag with Missouri Farmers Care. Join us for thoughtful conversations around the intersections of farmer, rancher, and consumer interests. Grab a seat, press play, and join the conversation. Welcome to this edition of Stand for Ag with Missouri Farmers Care. We're thrilled that you're back. And we're really excited to talk with Dan klein our guest today, and Missouri's Far- Missouri Farmers Care's first executive director, Dan. I was the first, and I've been told I'm one of the top two. <laughs> big shoes. <laughs> big shoes. Well, uh, Dan led this organization right out of the box when it was still in its infancy, Um, Dan came on, walked alongside the executive committee to form what has grown into Missouri Farmers Care. So we're thrilled to have you uh, come and and is now a member through the Missouri Limestone Association of Missouri Farmers Care. Uh, His life is coming full circle. So welcome to the program, Dan. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so let's, let's take a step back. Um, You have a diverse resume. We can go down a a lot of rabbit holes here in things you've experienced in Missouri agriculture and Missouri politics as well. But um, what were your days like at Missouri Farmers Care? A lot of campaigning, a lot of campaigning. In three and a half years, I worked on three different statewide campaigns, two of which went to the ballot. When I was first hired, the big concern was actually something called uh, Your Vote Counts. And it was an animal rights group was funding a ballot initiative. And what it essentially would have done was said, the legislature can never in the future amend anything passed by ballot initiative. And of course, they wanted to do that to strengthen their future ballot initiative campaigns. And so we basically launched an awareness campaign where we had town halls all over the state and talked to local press all over the state and had a lot of meetings to explain to people what the, what the extreme cost of that would be if it actually got put into place. And that organization dropped that campaign. And then we, we went from defense to offense and started working on right to farm. And uh, eventually right to farm uh, passed as narrowly as anything in the world could possibly pass. And I got to learn all about the recount process up front. Um, that was a very unique experience. Um, and yeah, so that was, I, that was the busiest three and a half years I've ever had. Absolutely. It is always a good thing when agriculture is in an is in a offensive position, right? We're often on our back foot playing defense. There's a lot of organizations and organized money out there um, working against agriculture. And so I think I still drive down the roads, Dan. And when shops are open on a day like this week when it's warm and hot, I see those right to farm, you know, pro amendment one yeah. signs from back in what 2011 that are yep. still yeah, hanging there's... proudly on shop walls. Yeah, it's, uh, I still see some from time to time too. And of course I have one in my own garage. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that was, uh, I, I learned a great deal in a short amount of time. I'm glad we got it, but it did. That was, that was as close as any election you will ever see. And for those that may not have been engaged in Missouri Ag, issues back over a, a decade ago that was enshrining the right to farm and engage in agricultural production practices in the Missouri constitution. Um, it wasn't it wasn't sealed, tied, and fully defined, but it did provide some constitutional protections, right, Dan? That have have proven, I think, as importantly as anything, to ensure that Missouri was not low hanging fruit when anti agricultural activists wanted to, you know, march essentially across the country to Washington D.C. and make broad sweeping changes in the way that we regulate agriculture in this country. We assure that uh, Missouri has taken a stand, and that was one of many measures that really successfully was at the edge of making sure agriculture and support is synonymous with Missouri. Yeah, and it, it was 2014 and, you know, it all came from some assaults from animal rights groups that, that happened years prior to that. And that's how Missouri Farmers got together, uh, Missouri Farmers Care got together. And it was, it was kind of the first step where I saw agricultural groups being more proactive about everything, about their PR, about communicating with the public, about political issues. And so it was, it was a great thing to do. Uh, Missouri Farmers Care, that time was incredible. I got to do the ALOT, Ag Leaders of Tomorrow program during that same period of time. So it was busy, but it was impactful. And I'm, I'm really glad I got a chance to do all that. 
I still think it should be a feather in your cap that Missouri Farmers Care um, is a lasting legacy of those early efforts. There are a lot of states that haven't been able to rec replicate the success of collaboration and partnership that Missouri agriculture groups have. They all uh, came together around their shared goals and missions, set aside you know, outside differences of opinion and policy and leadership that they may have, and have formed an exceptionally strong coalition that's lasted now for many years. And I think it's a um, should be an envy of a lot of other states that are strong agricultural producers because it enables our groups, our producers to speak with one loud voice collectively that I think would be missing without a kind of an umbrella organization, the collaboration of all the agriculture groups. And those are agriculture groups as diverse as the Missouri limestone producers to a poultry yep. and dairy yep. and ag teachers and levy and drainage districts and everybody else across the agricultural spectrum. And, and I think you see the same model replicated in other ways too. Uh, Missouri Limestone and, and some agriculture groups are also part of MFTI, Missouri Transportation Investment, which did something very similar for gas tax, for highway funding. It's a whole bunch of groups that have that, that common goal and they got together just like Missouri Farmers Care got together. So I, I think you'll see that more and more in the future. And it is a great way to pull resources and speak with one voice. Exactly. So let's dive a little bit into issues. It is the last week of Missouri's legislative session. Um, they are adjourning sine die at the end of this very week. And so let's talk about gas tax issues, transportation issues. Those farm to market roads are exceptionally important in agriculture. You sit around and talk to producers very much time at all. It's top of mind. So uh, where's the state? Where are we positioned? I know you may you may dive a little bit into your leadership in the Senate and you know you have kind of your experience there. And then let's talk a little bit about Missouri's transportation infrastructure and the investments we're making in it. Yeah, and, and this is an area where limestone and agriculture have almost identical uh, policy preference in transportation. Obviously, limestone huge fan of transportation investment because the roads are made out of rocks, but also because we have to transport our rock and heavy loads the same way agriculture products have to be transported and most quarries are in rural areas. So it's something we have in common a lot and my involvement in transportation issues, it was it was a present issue um, when I worked at Missouri Farmers Care, but it wasn't our top issue, of course. And then as the funding got further and further behind inflation, uh, I mean, we went from the mid nineties until last year without, essentially without uh, increasing transportation funding whatsoever. So a big focus when I worked for State Senator Dave Schatz, who's now become the President Pro Tem of the Senate, was increasing transportation funding. Mm -hmm. uh, we did that several ways, and we attempted to do that several ways. Mm -hmm. One was Proposition D, which actually failed a few years ago, uh, but kind of paved the groundwork for the refundable gas tax that is now being phased in over the next few years. And that is the first increase in core transportation funding since, um, well, since John Ashcroft in the 90s. Uh, one thing we were able to do when I worked for Senator Schatz, worked for him for six years, was a bridge bonding bill that was kind of proposed by the governor, came up with the idea. And the idea was to use a certain amount of general revenue, because general revenues were doing well, to uh -huh. bond a lot of uh, deficient bridges, structurally deficient bridges across the state, great many of them in rural areas. Yeah. And that was a way where we were able to kind of pull down some federal resources, use some state resources, and just advance a lot of projects on delinquent bridges. That also led in a fashion to the replacement of the Roachport Bridge on I-70, which is a, a choke point for traffic on a national of national importance because of the amount of freight traffic that travels over I-70 and through the Roachport Bridge. So in recent years, I would say transportation policy has become one of my key focuses. Uh, now, this this gas this refundable gas tax that was passed last year is under a bit of attack because you are seeing inflation across the board and you're seeing higher oil prices, although that's starting to stabilize. And so a big focus for MFTI this year and for the Missouri Limestone Producers and for many agriculture groups that supported the refundable gas tax is to defend that and make sure it remains on the books. And so far that defense has been very successful. Uh, the proponents of a repeal actually had got the, an amendment on a bill a few weeks ago and they got to a roll call vote in the house and they failed the vote. Wow. So the, ho the house representatives with about 50 or 60 absences, unusual, unusually high number of absences, uh, 
because I think people weren't expecting the vote to come up, actually rejected that amendment. So we feel good about that. We feel like transportation funding is pretty safe, but we'll feel a lot better at 6.01 on Friday when session adjourns. Absolutely. So I know on the clean water side, a lot of additional resources are coming down through the American Rescue Plan Act, the ARPA funding. Are we going to see an investment in rural areas from that post-COVID ARPA money that's coming? We're going to, there is a billions in backlog on the clean water side and um, sewer treatment side in infrastructure mm. needs. Will we see, I'm sure it's probably true in the drinking water side, on the transportation side, are we going to see some money be deployed um, in addition to county commissions, which have been deploying money over the last two years? Do we see some of that coming through the capital improvements bill or other uh, sources in the legislature the, through GR? The legislature just completed the budget last Friday, uh, hours before the constitutional mm -hmm. deadline. So that's always a plus. And it does. It increases uh, the, the MoDOT construction budget is basically going up 10%. Uh, it's a $150 million increase, now up to $1.5 billion. And some of that is very good for rural areas and rural infrastructure. A uh, couple notes here. The cost share program, which just a few years ago was zeroed out, is now up to $98 million, And that allows local governments like our counties and our cities to kind of team up with MoDOT and do 50-50 cost share programs. Um, there's a hundred million dollars set aside for maintenance and repair of low volume routes. So those are beloved lettered roads, yep. uh, which are kind of unique in Missouri that those are actually state highways. Those are not, you know, the, mm -hmm. those are not county maintenance. Um, and of course, we know a lot of those are in poor condition, just like a lot of the bridges we're, we're getting there. And uh, hopefully with this increased funding levels in a few years, we'll see we will gradually see real improvements. And we know we need that on major highways like I-70, but we also know we need it on some of the lettered routes. So mm -hmm. there is some help coming with that. It'll take some time. And in the contractor space, I can tell you uh, the people we work with, they're, they're facing the same labor shortages that everyone else is. But over time, we feel like the, the quality of Missouri infrastructure is really gonna improve in the next few years. That's all good news. That, that's good news for Missouri agriculture. You know, we're fighting, working on every front to double the economic value of Missouri's $94 billion agriculture industry. Pretty hard to do it without functional, efficient transportation modes. So that's all good news to hear. Uh, give us a little more. So you just came, you're fairly new to um, the Missouri limestone producers because you've spent several years in the capital. So I know that on behalf of your constituency, you've been keeping in real eye. What else has been maybe a bit of a log jam is how I would uh, define the session, but what else has been going on over there that's been of real interest to your members? Yeah, between my time at Missouri Farmers Care and now I, I spent six years working for State Senator Davis and got to learn the State Senate inside and out and uh, certainly dealt with my colleagues in the House quite a bit. And my career actually started as an intern in the House Representative. What is kind of going on right now is uh, intra-party division in Republican caucus, particularly in the state Senate. You have the self-proclaimed conservative caucus, um, which is to the right of most Republicans. And there's a lot of debates from that sub-caucus and the rest of the Republicans. And then you've got the Democrats who trying to get to uh, kind of get to play mischief, knowing that the majority party is, is split kind of one third, two third, one third in the conservative caucus, two third in, I guess what you just call the normal Republican caucus. The main debate uh, of many is the congressional redistricting. The conservative caucus essentially wanted to cut the map in such a way that Kansas City would not have a Democrat. Um, so the, the eight, the seven one map instead of the six two map, it looks like it's going to be 6-2, except the legislature has not completed the map. In Missouri, our state legislative districts are drawn by a bipartisan commission, and if they fail, the courts draw them. This year, the courts draw this, drew the Senate map, but the bipartisan commission completed the state house map. Now, when it comes to congressional redistricting, that is up to the state legislature and signed by the governor like a normal bill. The house has passed several maps. The Senate 
has passed a map that the House didn't agree with. No one can agree on where to cut the lines, particularly in uh, more populous suburban areas like Jefferson County and St. Charles County. And so as of now, with uh, five legislative days left in session, there is no congressional map. So when you see people running for Congress, they don't actually know exactly what district, what the district's going to look like. Uh, at a certain point, I think there's already been lawsuits launched. Yep. If they don't complete a map by Friday, I mean, I think you'll you'll see the courts will have to draw some kind of map. Yep, I think so too. And this is in the midst of an election year where filing has opened. Um, candidates are filing for districts that are a bit unknown, right? That's um, a lot of potential chaos in yeah. the Yeah, especially especially candidates in, in central Missouri could, you know, you could be drawn in any one of given directions. So some of them don't actually know what district they're going to end up in. Um, this debate has bled over and caused problems in every other single, every single thing that's been in front of the state Senate. So right now with five legislative days left, there have been exactly seven bills that have been truly and finally passed and sent to the governor. Very, very low number. Five of those bills are House bills and only two are Senate bills. And having looked at them, most of them are really pretty inconsequential um, in, and not just not very large bills and, and not very in-depth. So what's going to happen this week? We're not really sure. There's always a lot of legislation that passes in the final week. But uh, to say the least, it has been an unusually unusually unproductive session in a, one filled with unusually things. Yeah. And an average year may have 160 or more bills passed. Is that about right? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, not, not counting the budget bills yeah. over a hundred, over a hundred truly agreed and finally passed bills is, is not unusual. Sometimes those are one sentence long. Sometimes they're dozens of pages long. It, it can vary greatly, but what we're seeing right now is it looks like it's going to be much, much, much less than that. In some ways, that can be good, but in other ways, you know, if if you're if you're working on something that you know is an industry priority for agriculture or issues I have, like you know, last year we needed to pass the the uh, the gas tax. We had to do something positive and get that passed through both chambers and onto the governor's desk. Thank goodness we're not trying to do that this year because hardly anything is getting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a very unusual year, kind of the culmination of simmering issues for years and years and years with this Republican infighting that has really boiled to the surface because of the lack of a consensus on how to draw these eight congressional, eight congressional district lines. Yeah. Agriculture's priority has gotten caught in that same log jam. There's an um, agricultural omnibus bill that was picked up because it was an omnibus bill last year that didn't make it across the finish line yeah. that includes Missouri Ag and Small Business Development Authority authorization for their tax credits and value-added programs. One that I think the vast majority of people could not argue against the benefits, right, of spurring entrepreneurship across the state and um, co-ops and agricultural processing and development that we somehow cannot get uh, reauthorized, which a few years ago would have been unheard of to think that we could yeah, get yeah. that widely supported program not through for two years. And there's going to be negative implications across, you know, our ability to, to spur, recruit and develop homegrown businesses if there aren't those business development tools in place on the agricultural side of the ledger. Yeah, a, a recent a, a recent trend in the state legislature is to ensure that programs have sunsets, so they don't just go on indefinitely, and they are reviewed and looked at by successive generations. A lot of times, sunsets last about five years. That's a really good idea. When you have this kind of acrimony, you end up with a situation where a popular program sunsetted and can't get renewed because nothing can get renewed. So. You get a lot, a lot of things kind of fail uh, to make it across the finish line that under a normal year wouldn't have that problem. Um, it, that's been happening more and more in recent years. Um, and that's why we saw a lot of special sessions called by the governor in previous years. Uh, and this year, I don't know, we might have a similar thing. It's kind of kind of hard to call those special sessions when it's also an election year because so many of our state legislators have to go back out for re-election. But 
I don't, when we get to the finish line on Friday at 6 p.m., I'm not sure how many bills will actually have gotten across or not. Yep. It is a tough situation. Like you said, um, there's, there's good to having balance, but some things fundamentally have to get across the finish line. Um, what else, Dan, should we cover or hit on? Um, I, I just think it's kind of important for listeners to take a close look at, at who's running in the primary and pay attention to politics at that Mm -hmm. uh something i've learned more and more about it, how how it impacts agriculture how it impacts the limestone industry yep. you know the in in most districts to be frank whether it's an urban area or a suburban area or a rural area the legislator is really picked in the august primary and that's really just a few months away yep. so you know take a look at who's running ask them contact them ask them how they stand on these issues and yep. let that, that inform your vote agreed it is I find even up here in Northeast Missouri, pretty easy to know your elected officials, right? With a little bit of effort, they are looking to connect with their constituents. Sure. Yeah. So I find yeah. it's really important when you know the people, what they're made of and their commitment to your shared values, it's easy to cast a vote. And um, I find, you know, I, I have a lot of peers that are somewhat disheartened with the political process and I can see why. But when you know the individuals and most everyone is in it for the right reasons, policy implications matter on a state level. Um, it's good to know everybody from the top to the bottom of the ballot that you can, that represents you, I concur. Yeah, these kind of things matter for us. I mean, I, I grew up on a farm in rural Montgomery County and I live in a rural part of Callaway County. My mm -hmm. wife and I are very lucky that we have high-speed fiber internet access uh, courtesy of our local electric co-op. Yep. My parents still don't have that. Um, they don't have that. Many parts of, of rural Missouri are still are still lacking that. That's the kind of thing you want to ask a candidate when they're asking for your vote is where they stand on issues like that. How they're going? How are they going to finance rural infrastructure? Because that doesn't just mean roads and bridges. It also means fiber internet. It, it means access to lots of things. So I, I think it's really important to take a close look at those issues and and understand who's running for what and what their platform is. Mm -hmm. And their, their willingness and ability to lead is exceptionally important. You're right. There are some real leaders on broadband. I mean, just imagine trying to, you know, our, our AgriReady County designation, for instance, our goal is to open elementary students' eyes to the agricultural around them, use the tools through 4-H and FFA and uh, community colleges and mm -hmm. our state universities to equip them to go be the labor force of tomorrow in those industries, build and expand and grow on all the opportunities that we have. But how are you going to get those same bright kids back home with no high speed internet access? It's not even probably under consideration, right? Without a big farm to come home to, that's going to support them. Yeah. Yep. You're not going to get entrepreneurs and innovators back home. Yeah, that is precisely right. Yeah. Um, we, I think a lot of rural areas actually have a golden opportunity with this work from home movement that if they have good internet access that they have something they can offer they can offer wide open spaces and affordable housing. Yep. But uh, you, you've got to have you've got to have access got to have access to infrastructure to, to be able to offer that. Exactly. I see that boom happening. There's a lot of out of town and out of state individuals moving to our rural community because of work from home opportunities. They want to either get back yeah. to their roots or find some open space and a low cost of living. And rural Missouri has that uh, to offer and more. So I agree. I see that happening a lot. It, but roads and internet do matter and places to shop and places to eat and other things that, that you and I have talked about in the past. If I, if I can yeah. say one thing, uh, it has been great to have worked for Missouri Farmers Care and now uh, mm -hmm. working for the Missouri Limestone Producers to be a member of Missouri Farmers Care. Um, I love how much overlap there is between limestone and agriculture. Of course, ag lime being the most obvious, mm -hmm. but uh, both industries are largely located in rural areas and offer a good living to people, mm -hmm. providing a resource to the public that is absolutely vital for modern life. And so yes. I'm very blessed that I got to, got to work on, on a similar organization, mm -hmm. similar mission for two different organizations. Agreed. I would say the same, you know, you encourage people to get engaged and know their elected official. 
I would say the same about engaging in your association that's relevant to your yeah. oh, aspect yeah. of an industry, right? That up here, um, 120 miles from the Capitol, I don't think I have stepped foot in the building this year, truly. However, yeah. there have been our agricultural organizations that I'm personally a member of for our farm and ranch that have been representing us every single week in the Capitol. And that can be said across the spectrum and across the board. So. Yeah, I, I can see how Jefferson City can seem like a faraway place for a lot of people, but your local cattlemen's, your local mm -hmm. farm bureau, your, you know, regional director, corn growers, soybean, these are people you do know. These are people you can see all the time and communicate with them and communicate your preferences through your association up to Jefferson City. So yeah, I think it's very important to be involved in local organizations like, because that is, that is your voice in Jefferson City a lot of times, if you don't know your state representative personally, if you don't know your state senator personally. Although mm -hmm. you should reach out and meet those people too. But when that's not possible, there's many, many worthwhile organizations that people can be part of. Exactly. They've all been working hard on um, the ag issues, eminent domain, personal property rights, and more this session that have also been hot topics that I know um, are so vitally important to so many across rural Missouri. And I think uh, I think agriculture's prominence in the capital has mm -hmm. has improved in recent years because of that coordination. Each organization has their own priorities and their own own way of communicating with uh, legislators and stakeholders. But everyone also knows that they work together when it matters. And yes. I think that that kind of rising tide lifts all boats in agriculture mm -hmm. in that in that regard. Yep, agreed. And we've collaborated and coordinated with our elected officials on issues like supporting the expansion of the Missouri State Fair. We have an unprecedented opportunity to add another 200 acres and a large exhibition yeah. facility. That will be huge for Missouri, right? We're already at crossroads. People are crisscrossing across this nation to go show and exhibit and gather. Yeah. And yeah. what a great opportunity. So yeah, that's that's an exciting project. There's there's a lot of infrastructure that's kind of been on the sidelines yes. for decades that might finally have a chance to get done here soon. Yes, that will be a positive outcome from this legislative session that we will see. You know, those those budget bills have crossed the finish line, and so we're excited to see what happens with that uh, historic investment and more. Yeah, and you know a lot of that's federal funding, and uh, the the federal government will have to figure out a way to pay this off at some point. But in yeah. the short term, it is providing opportunities for states that that have been on the sidelines for a long time. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Well, it has been a pleasure to connect with you briefly on this busy last week of session. We've appreciated your time, your leadership, and your insight, as well as your membership, and that of your members in Missouri Farmers Care. Um, those that are in the limestone industry, feel free to reach out. Uh, while we're spreading agricultural lime through this year and into the fall, we'll be thinking of the connections between limestone and agriculture as well, Dan, and certainly appreciate it. Yes, thank you again for having me and thank you for everything you do in Missouri Farmers Bureau. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Dan built a strong foundation. Our programs have grown dramatically since his time leading statewide ballot initiatives um, have grown into a whole host of programs that uh, we've touched on all, all throughout Stand for Ag. So um, we just appreciate that we had that strong base to build from. And we've appreciated you listening for what has become season four of Stand for Ag with Missouri Farmers Care. We are going to wrap it this season take a brief break on our stand for ag production and tune in as we launch season five later this summer and delve into a whole nother host of issues topics and the individuals that make missouri agriculture the powerhouse that it is thank you for joining the stand for ag podcast with missouri farmers care we're excited to bring you new stories each week we as agriculturalists have a lot of stories to tell. Stories of resilience, grit, and stories of families that are united by their passion for agriculture. Each week, tune in for a new episode and join the conversation.